Hey guys, it's Kompeki here, and I brought to you guys today another brand new mechanics video where I cover every single Valorant mechanic. The last video where I covered every single Valorant mechanic did really well, and you guys really enjoyed watching that. And so what I did was I taught this lesson again inside of my coaching program. However, this time I brought on even more examples of myself as well as other pro players in the hopes that it helps you guys understand these concepts even better. I included a mindset portion in the beginning of the video, and I highly suggest that you stick around and watch that portion of the video as well because I share all those mindset topics on what the traits of a successful student looks like inside of our program. So first, I'll go over what mindset it takes to actually win in Valorant, how to actually climb, how to improve as a better player. And then I'll get into all the different mechanics that exist in the game. I'll go over examples of when to use them, as well as show you guys some drills and exercise that you can do to also practice them in and out of the game. If you guys would like to see more videos on in-depth breakdowns of mechanics in the game, leave a comment below and let me know. And again, I make these videos in the hopes that it helps those of you guys who can't afford to pay for coaching. But if you can't afford it and you're interested in working with me and my team of Radiant Coaches, where we guarantee that you gain 500 RR in just eight weeks or your money back guaranteed, then use the link down below to book a free call with me or one of my coaches to see if you'd be a good fit. Last time, all the spots filled up in just two weeks, so don't wait to take this free call. With that said, hope you guys enjoy the rest of the video. Let's go over mindset. Some of you guys might have been playing the game for a long time. Some of you guys might have just started, but a lot of the information around mechanics is out there. But mindset, I rarely see coaches and content creators talk about what it actually takes to win. Because Valorant is about winning. And the mindset that the top people have in any industry is completely different from 99% of the people. If you want to reach the top 1% of anything you do in life in general, like this is not just strictly Valorant, but anything in life, you got to think differently than 99% of people. It's about working on yourself to change and to become a person that actually deserves to be, let's say, an X rank or like Radiant or Immortal. So let's get into this. A good mindset involves having a growth mindset, taking responsibility, being humble, and avoiding burnout. And I'm going to expand on each of these points. So growth mindset. What does it mean to have a growth mindset? You don't want to be afraid of failure. So reward yourself for noticing mistakes and learn from them instead of rewarding yourself for the outcomes. A lot of times people like to measure their wins and success based on outcomes. But the most successful people in the world, they measure their wins based on the inputs of work that it actually took to get the results. So there's a very big difference between winning, let's say a game of Valorant without you actually knowing what the heck you did. You might've just gotten lucky, but if you're happy about that, then that's giving yourself an excuse not to assess your wins based on what you actually could have done. Like, did you actually push yourself to the limits? Did you actually put in the hours to, to practice? and win? Did you actually show up when it was hard to? There are times when you don't want to aim train, just like going to the gym. There are times you don't want to show up to the gym. This is one of the best lessons that I've learned just in life in general. Like if I ever want to accomplish something great, whether it was hitting radiant, whether it was growing this coaching program, whether it was growing a successful YouTube channel, all these things, it is very tempting to try to allow my emotions to be swayed by the wins that I get. But it's about the journey, not the destination. If you can focus on making sure you show up every single day, whether or not you had a really bad day of losing all your games or you won a lot of your games, it doesn't matter because you yourself at the end of the day know that you put in your all and you actually tested and pushed your limits. And this is actually really hard to do for most people because we as humans have been designed to conserve our energy. But if you truly want to be the best in anything you do, this is what it takes. This is the type of mindset that you need to have. So you don't want to obviously repeat the same thing over and over again, expecting different outcomes, change up things, keep making small improvements over time. It's about thousand little things that you work on that add up over time versus one big leap that you take. Learning game knowledge is good, but you need to practice and play to build intuition around the knowledge. So 20% of the work is just learning the information that exists in the game. Because if you don't know, let's say it takes seven seconds to defuse a spike, then you might take too long during a retake. Those are basic information that you need to learn. There's also nuanced information, but that's 20% of the work. You still need to play and practice to actually apply this information, which is 50% of the work. And then feedback, it's about 30% of the work. Whether it's giving yourself feedback through looking through your own gameplay or whether it's getting feedback from coaches, the faster that feedback loop gets, the faster you're going to improve.
This model represents the stages that people go through when it comes to mastering a skill. So in the beginning, you're unaware that you suck. <laughs> you're unaware of the things that it takes to even be good at mastering the skill. And so this is where, you know, you might be iron or bronze. Well, to get to one stage to the next from here, you need to be aware of what deficiencies you have. Once you've realized the deficit, you don't know how to do this new skill yet. And so this stage requires a lot of practice and feedback so that eventually you understand and know how to do and perform the skill, but it still takes heavy conscious involvement in executing the new skill. This is conscious confidence, okay? And this is where the majority of players I'd say are stuck in when they're between the ranks of platinum all the way to ascendant because there are advanced skills and topics that you need to master in order for you to hit immortal radiant but it requires you to think a lot and that leaves a lot of gaps that that causes tunnel visioning tunnel visioning <laughs> during your games where you where you hyper focus on one thing and then you forget to focus on other things but then with enough repetition and practice you get to the unconscious competence part of the game the skill becomes second nature to you and can be performed easily and you know you've really reached true mastery if you can also teach it to other people and so let's say we're talking about looking at the mini map in the very beginning of the game you're not going to even realize how to use a mini map or that it's even there or you know it's there but you don't know what to make out of the information and then the stage after that you sort of get it but you're still trying to figure out what it all means you're trying to get in the habit of looking at it. And then the conscious competence, this is where you have to sometimes force yourself to remember to look at the mini map here and there during important scenarios. Let's say like right before executing a site, right before rotating, things like that. And then the unconscious competence part, you're just very familiar with utilizing the mini map and how to utilize the information that you get from the mini map. Okay, now the third point, being humble. So this is really interesting. The point is the less experience you have, the less unknown encounters you're going to come across. But the more experience you have, you're going to realize there's actually so much more that you don't know about a topic. The point is you're never going to know enough. Okay. Even myself, there are still things that I'm learning about the game every single day. And so if you make it about the learning, if you make it about just enjoying the experience of growing and improving as a player, you're going to be able to go so much further. So the Dunning-Kruger effect goes over how your confidence, your conviction changes from mountaintops to valleys as you are developing your skill. And so in the very beginning, you don't know anything. You have this beginner's luck. You just have all this confidence, all new game. Like I'm just going to run it down. You're at the peak of Mount Stupid. <laughs> As you start to get destroyed by smurfs or people higher rank than you, you fall into this value of despair where you feel like you know nothing about the game, you suck. But as you continue to increase your knowledge, as you continue to grow your competence by showing up every day, by staying consistent with putting in the practice and time it takes to learn things, you're going to start to grow more and more and more in confidence. And so if you ever come across a situation where your confidence is low, it just means there are still a lot of things you have yet to learn. Okay. But once that gets sorted out, you're going to be able to get to a point where you can have confidence at a sustainable level. That's why if you watch a lot of pros, when they stream, they have a lot of confidence in the plays that they make because they've gone through this whole process of learning and trial and error. So they know on autopilot what the best play is. For instance, this ladder analogy, I wanted to show you guys to represent how improvement in skills also work. Think of each side of the ladder as different components of the game that you need to master. Let's just say the left hand side represents your mechanics. The right hand side represents your game sense and the middle rungs going through the ladder represent your mental. No matter how high one side of the ladder is or no matter which part of the ladder is, it's only going to be limited by the lowest part of the ladder. So it doesn't matter if your mechanics are really good, your game sense is really good. If your mental is down here you're only going to be able to go up this far even if your mental is really good your game sense is really good but your mechanics still need a lot of work maybe it's like up here this is the highest you're going to be able to climb and so if you can identify which parts are actually holding you back the most 
that's going to help you speed up the progress exponentially. This equation can represent the amount of overall success that you had with mastering a skill or industry, whatever it may be. So your R is a rate of growth that you have. So R can be increased through coaching, feedback, learning new skills, acquiring knowledge. And the more you can shorten the feedback loop, like I mentioned, the faster R increases. And N represents time. You can measure it by day, weeks, months, years you choose but the most successful people in the world measure it by decades. If you want to achieve anything great in life, if you want to achieve anything big, it takes time. And so if we can combine both making sure our R is as high as it can be by learning as much as we can, acquiring new skills and knowledge, and we also make sure we give plenty of time for us to be able to see this growth, then the end result's gonna be crazy. And so don't compare yourself from other people who might be further along ahead of you in this journey of improvement or playing the game. Like if you watch tens, if you see all these pros that you are inspired by, those guys have been playing not only Valorant from beta, but also have played professionally to some extent in other FPS games, such as Counter-Strike, Overwatch. Like they've already put in the work and it's just compounding more and more and more over time as they switch to other games. Players in Valorant that I've talked to, they were nobodies to be honest with you with other games that they've played, but they just kept at it. They didn't give up. And over time, they saw a lot of improvement and got the results that a lot of people think, oh, wow, it's an overnight success. It's not. It took a lot of time. Everyone wants mountaintop experiences, but they don't realize it's the mundane day-to-day -day activities, the day-to-day -day work that you put in that actually takes you to the mountaintop experiences. And the last thing I wanted to talk about was burnout. Burnout is a form of exhaustion caused by constantly feeling swamped. In many cases, burnout is related to one's job and burnout happens when you're overwhelmed, emotionally drained, and unable to keep up with life's incessant demands. So to avoid burnout, you don't want to treat this like a job because if you start to treat this as a job that you dread, like going to work, things like that, then it's going to take a toll on you over time. You're doing this to have fun. What I encourage you guys to do when you're feeling burnt out, take a quick break, watch different streamers, pro players with the agent that you want to learn. Just analyze how they play. Just keep learning. What I like to do when I'm watching other players play, I pretend like I'm in their shoes in every single scenario. So based on the start of the round, the round state, all these things, I'm thinking about what I would do if I were in their shoes. And if what the pro player does deviates from what I had in mind, then I'm going to ask myself, okay, why are they doing that when I probably would have chose to do something else? And that's really helpful, I think, when it comes to actually learning agents too. When I was learning Jet to hit Radiant, I watched a lot of like Tarek. And I remember I would analyze, okay, when I entry onto, let's say, A site on Icebox, I usually take this entry pathing route. But when I'm watching Tarek, oh wow, like he has a really different entry pathing than I do. And then I'm thinking, okay, why is he doing that? Like I'm comparing and contrasting what I do normally compared to the pros. And then I'm thinking about why they're doing the things they're doing. And then actually I'm going to go in game and try it out. So that actually helps with burnout because you actually have something new that you want to work on. You're coming up with a list in your head of, okay, I want to work on this. I want to work on this next, instead of just autopiloting going next, right? <laughs> and trying to do the same thing all over again. That's the definition of insanity. I hope it was really helpful because if you don't have the right mindset, you're just not going to get the most out of anything you want to improve in. All right, let's get into mechanics. So mouse grip. If you are using palm grip, I highly recommend that you at least try to switch to claw grip because there's a good reason for it. <laughs> I have a whole slide afterwards, but you want to use your thumb and ring finger or pinky as anchor points onto the mouse pad. When it comes to the mouse pad, make sure your mouse pad is big enough to track targets. And if your desk isn't big enough, make sure you get a bigger desk to be able to support a bigger mouse pad. Sensitivity, your in-game sensitivity multiplied by your mouse DPI dots per inch equals your effective dots per inch. And so pro players and myself alike play between 200 to 400 edpi and they average around 260 to 280 edpi because in valorant a lot of times you're not going to be required to hit these massive flicks and track really really fast moving targets precision and accuracy matters most so this range of sensitivities will work best for you guys gotta know the difference between warming up and aim training because warming up, you don't want to spend, you know, an hour long warming up. I, I've seen people do that too. That That is too long. That is too excessive. That's literally just 
aim training. I would just focus on keeping your warm ups to around 20, 30 minutes tops, a few minutes in the range, or aim trainers, and then hopping on maybe like one or two death matches, and then just getting the game started. Any more than that is a waste of time. You're going to get more out of your time by just actually playing the comp match and, and learning from that. But when it comes to aim training, that is something that I recommend you guys do after your comp games before you're about to sleep. All right, and so this is the motor cortex homunculus. It looks really freaky and weird, but this diagram shows the amount of nerves and control your motor nerves have in your body. So when it goes to like your toes, you're not going to have as much control, feel, and your fingertips actually have a lot of concentrated nerves. Using your fingertips to actually aim and control your aim is going to be much, much more beneficial and actually taking advantage of our human anatomy compared to using our palm grip, which yes, you, you still have a lot of motor functions and control, but with palm, you're actually relying a lot on also your wrist, your elbow, your shoulder. Whereas if you use a claw grip, you're able to use not only your fingertips to control a lot of fine movements for micro adjustments in Valorant, but also you, you still get the benefits of everything you get in a palm grip. I hope that helps with my argument. And this is just mouse grip. This is the mouse grip that I use. So as you can see, this is a claw grip. Notice how my thumb is slightly below the bottom of the mouse so that it touches the mouse pad. There's a gap right here too between my mouse. And this allows me to actually hold down my mouse with a lot of fine control for spray control. And also my ring finger and pinky right there right it also sits slightly below the bottom of the mouse so that it kind of doesn't really dig in that hard on, onto the mouse pad but it brushes up against it every time i move it and so this will help you get direct feedback on how much you're moving the mouse as you're playing the game and practicing and this is gonna be really helpful and so yeah i'm just like pulling down like i just showed you that's how i control my spray so there's like a little gap here for me if you have a bigger mouse you might not have a gap here and that's totally fine uh, but i'm just showing that for me, when I pull down, like I also get another tactile response from my palm to know exactly how much I pulled down. So there's a lot of weird grips out there too. So there's no one size fits all, but if you are curious about uh, what mouse grip I use and what a lot of players use, then this is the claw grip. So now let's get into the components of aim. So active aim and passive aim. Those are the two components of aim. Your active aim is everything that involves your mouse movement during gunfights. So flicking is when, okay, can you guys see my mouse cursor? If I just quickly like spaz out my, my hand and just go boom, okay, that, that's a flick. Boom, okay. Tracking. If this reticle was moving across the screen, um, if I just follow along that target with my mouse, that is tracking. Micro adjustments is little finer movements that I make to really make sure our crosshairs align with our target. And then when it comes to gun mechanics, there's spray control. So that requires you to also pull down our mouse. And there are different patterns when it comes to the different guns in the game. It's also understanding how to burst, tap, or spray, depending on different scenarios. And then aim trainers is also what's going to help you with their active aim. And there's also different routines that I'm going to show you guys inside the practice range to also help. I recommend aim trainers if you're new to FPS. And aim trainers still help uh, a lot of pro players, a lot of advanced players. But if you are not even immortal yet, I highly recommend you guys focus the majority of your time working on your active aim through playing deathmatch, through a lot of the drills I'm going to show you in a bit inside the game. Okay, because it's not just flicking, tracking micro adjustments that make up our active aim, but gun mechanics too, spread control and understanding all these things, ADSing, uh, stuff like that. And then passive aim is actually 80% of your aim. So again, like you don't want to spend too much time working on this because as you are playing the game, guys, even when it comes to crosser placement, having really snappy crosser placement that a lot of pros have, that will force you to work on your flicks, tracking and micro distance anyways. So you don't need to spend, again, too much time on aim trainers. If you work on your passive aim, it's going to incorporate a lot of your active aim anyways. So your passive aim is crosser placement when you're not in the middle of a gunfight. Those are things like understanding variations in height, depending on distance and platform heights, and using objects around the map as guidelines. What's most important are your micro flicks and your micro adjustments, as well as tracking. These bigger flicks too are helpful when it comes to cross placement, but again, it's these small adjustments that you'll make after you flick from corner to corner when you are clearing angles, as well as making small adjustments from the angle that you're holding when a person peeks you. 
So with spray control. So if we go to the 10 meter mark and I just shoot five bullets. Okay. It goes, the bullets slightly go up first three bullets and then it starts to jump up on the fourth and fifth. And with the phantom, it doesn't go up as much. All right. So the height is a little bit lower. So to counteract the recoil, we need to pull down our crosshair the same distance, right? But the opposite direction. And so with the phantom, it's about to the crotch. Okay. So if I shoot five bullets and then I let go after I pull down, see how I get a tight grouping and then my crosshair ends up down here. But with a vandal, it's slightly below it. Okay. So right underneath here. So. So it's like beneath the crotch. This is how you get really tight groupings across any range. Because the distance that I pull down at the 10 meter mark here with my mouse is the same for 30 meters. Okay, right here. Even though I pull down from the head all the way down, it's the same distance with my mouse. It's just muscle memory. It's the same across every single range. All right. So this is something to keep in mind. If your target is, I'd say like 20 meters or less, like it's fine to just spray. Especially 10 meter mark, you can just spray. Five meter mark, you should just, you can honestly just be like running and gunning, but they did nerf this a lot. So just be careful. But with, with a gun like Phantom, it's a lot easier. 20 to 30 meters. This is where you can incorporate 80, 80 strafing. This is shooting in bursts of two to three and resetting our recoil between our strafes, okay? So this is how we can win a lot of our gunfights. You guys might have noticed, every time I shoot, I actually do still pull down a little bit, okay? The reason being, if I don't pull down, right now it looks fine, right? This is just two bullet bursts. I'm not pulling down at all. But if I get to the 30 meter mark, and I bring it closer, you see how like that second bullet is actually going above their head? So you want to get in the habit of pulling down at least even a little if you're going to do two to three round bursts, okay? And so same thing with the Vandal. When it is really far at range, you want to ADS with the Vandal, but with the Phantom, it's not completely necessary. The reason for this is because our first shot spread here on the right hand side with the Phantom, it's only 0.2 when it's not scoped in. With the Vandal, it's 0.25. So I have really far distances right now. Even if my crosshair is dead centered onto the head, if I don't ADS, Vandal, that one's a hit. That one missed. That's a hit. That's a hit. That one missed. That one missed. So it's like 50-50 chance. But if I ADS, it goes up to like 80%. So going from the left to the right, I just want you guys to shoot five bullets with the Vandal or Phantom, your gun of choice. But I just want to make sure you guys are getting tight grouping, so. And, and again, like I'm going left, right, head height from this bot. So if you notice the bullets are going a little high, that means you're not pulling down fast enough. And if your bullets do this, that means you're pulling down too much or too fast at, all at once. Oh, speaking of gun hygiene, classic, unless you're like really close, tap please, because the recoil gets out of control really fast. Shorty, if you can crouch, even better to tighten up the grouping. Frenzy, it's just like rifle, like you should still try to stand still a little bit because the moment you start running, it goes crazy. But if you are close range, you should be running and gunning with this. Uh, Ghost, again, don't spam like this. Look at where all the bullets are going. Just tap, okay? With the Sheriff, I like to use the song Staying Alive. So bam, 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 Staying Alive, okay? Stinger, you can pull down if you ADS, but it's still really inaccurate, but that helps. Ideally though, you take fights close range. Spectre, it's more accurate. You can ADS with it. A little bit more accurate but what are you doing taking fights this far okay with an smg you don't want to do that bucky they didn't nerf the shots when you jump with the bucky so it's actually really strong but with the judge the the grouping is like really wide if you jump so it's not as good so try to just just run straight and the judge actually has a recoil pattern where it goes up 
to the right and then back to the left like that so you can kind of pull down the opposite way if you really want to control the recoil on a judge bulldog ADS is actually really good because all you have to do is just like pull down a little bit because if I don't pull down the bullets still go up a little bit so I just pull down ever so slightly and it's it's like a laser beam headshot body shot it's just like a phantom when you ADS so it's really good oh uh, there's no weapon and accuracy with the guardian so try to actually ADS with this gun if you're 30 meters and above Marshall hit firing is really great and if you crouch in between your shots, it's pretty much like almost always accurate. Like even medium distances. They need to nerf this gun. In my opinion. With the op, you can jump peek with it. They nerfed it a lot. So you really got to get the distance right. Because you might over peek. You might be overexposed before you can really take an accurate shot. You can also get used to um, getting that timing down for a quick scope. And then Aries. Generally, you always want to ADS unless you're really close. And the recoil is just pretty much goes straight up and then goes left and right. So you just counteract it. Odin shoots faster if you're scoped in. If, if you feel a gun going left and right, you can just control a little bit by going the opposite direction. The second drill is with classic or ghost. If you're going to use the ghost, you want to have armor on. With the classic, it doesn't matter. Because what we want to do is be able to hit at least two dinks to each bot. Okay, so without armor, we can dink the bots twice in the head, but with the ghost, it's going to one shot them. So we need to have armor on. What I do is come to this part of the range. Notice how right here, you can see that the tile doesn't line up right here and just stand right in the middle. Okay. And what you want to do is we're going to work on our flicks and micro adjustments. If we watch pro players and how they aim in the latter half of our lesson, you're going to notice that they always, always, always micro adjust unless it's like a micro flick. But a lot of times they will micro adjust if they have the time to do so. What we're going to do is pick any two targets. So one, two. Okay. What we're going to do is flick, micro adjust, shoot, flick, micro adjust, shoot, flick, micro adjust, shoot, flick, micro adjust, shoot. Okay. This is all we're doing. And then again, I pick the next two targets. One, two. So one, two, one, two, one. So I micro just two, one, two. Okay. And I only shoot when I know my cross is fully on the target. I never shoot if it's slightly off. This means I'm forced to micro just every single time and light up my shot. The reason why this is so important is because you, you guys saw it earlier too, how sometimes even our first bullet doesn't land accurately. And after our first bullet, it's complete RNG. Look at this. Sometimes it goes to the left. It goes really to the left. That one went slightly to the right. So you don't want to leave your odds to just luck every time. So your first bullet actually matters the most. And if you miss your first bullet and following after that, because you didn't micro just before shooting, then again, you're, you're left with, you're left with trusting luck again, because now you have to keep track of the moving target while also trying to control your spray. And that's how you whiff a lot of times. So that's what this drill is going to help us out with. So flick, micro just shoot, flick, micro just shoot, and I can just speed it up. So notice how after I flick, there's always a quick snap to the head before I shoot, quick snap. So again, if I'm whiffing these shots, so I barely missed that one, I kind of missed that one, slow down a little, okay? And if you feel like your flicks and micro flicks and micro adjustments are really consistent, but your wider flicks aren't as much, then you can purposely choose targets that are further away, okay? So it takes a bit longer, but at least it forces us to make sure we can flick and micro adjust every single time. The next drill that I want to show you guys uh, has to do with dead zoning and crown strafing. Got to understand shooting error. I'm going to turn this on right here. If we go to video stats, scroll all the way down, shooting error. So if I shoot right now, these orange bars mean my bullets are perfectly accurate for how much the, the gun can afford. So right now it's 0.2, right? The first shot spread if I'm not moving at all. But if I start shooting a lot, I'm going to have more shooting error. Okay, the graph goes up. So I'm going to show also our crosshair. I'm going to go to my inner lines and have movement error on. So yeah. every time I move, it shows that my bullets are going to be inaccurate. But notice how in between changes of direction, my crosshair actually does shrink. And so this is where 
our guns are going to be accurate since the bullets accuracy in this game is determined by our character's velocity. So if I'm not moving, my velocity is zero. Velocity is just speed plus direction. If there are changes in direction, our velocity also has to go to zero because if let's say I'm going to the right, that's positive velocity. If I go to the left from the starting point, that's negative velocity. So it cancels out with dead zoning or counter strafing. It's really taking advantage of this fact. The term counter strafing was coined in Counter-Strike because in Counter-Strike, the character model actually feels like they have ice skates on. Like once you let go of the key, like it still kind of keeps gliding a little bit more to the left or more to the right. And so players had to tap the opposite direction key to come to a complete stop before they're able to shoot their gun accurately. In Valorant, you don't get that ice skate effect as much, but the difference is still very, 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 very minor. It's there but it's almost negligible. However, it's really useful to get in the habit of counter strafing. And if you ask a lot of pros, a lot of them, they do counter strafe because what it does help with is controlling the distance of your peaks. I know this is a controversial topic. Um, I, I've seen like Wuhu Jane about counter strafing. I personally found that this really helps you control the distance of your peaks. Like I wanna be able to come to a complete stop on command by counter strafing. To even get to this point where you're really comfortable with your movement, gotta do this drill first. So what I'm gonna do, come to this pole, come straight here, okay? Right where the shadows are at. I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna end here, okay? So this is about middle between this and this point. This is level one of the drill. Shoot once. And the whole time I'm gonna be moving left and right without stopping. Okay, so this is practicing our dead zoning, but dead zoning is when you're constantly moving left and right. And you're actually only able to shoot one bullet accuracy while you're dead zoning. Because look, notice how the second bullet has a blue line on the shooting graph. That means the second bullet was inaccurate. I guess you can do two with the Phantom. With a Vandal, for sure, two bullets, the second bullet will not be accurate. But I guess with the Phantom, you can do two but it's really hard to get that two bullet window. So ideally, you just wanna do one bullet with this uh, drill. I just wanna see you shooting only one bullet. And if you have a hard time actually like tapping, just use a guardian for this. And so this actually allows us to get really familiarized to stopping our peaks whenever we want this distance. And I'm not moving my mouse at all here, okay? I'm only aiming with my movement. Level two is just half the distance. Like this. Level three is half the distance of that. You can also use this pull here. All right. And the level four, this is where we can now use our mouse and track one single point. So yeah, so tracking. So this is the final level when it comes to dead zoning. This will allow you to shoot any target as you're moving completely accurately okay there's like an advanced level level five ideally in practice i would not move on to the next level until 95 percent of your shots are showing orange bars okay if you see blue bars in there that means you're not consistent enough to move on to the next level but this is level five this is ascendant immortal above you can also dead zone with the flick so you can practice that as well so this is much harder to do but you'll notice a lot of pros being able to pull these shots off if let's say like you you peek around an angle and then you see a guy like you can quickly react and get accurate shots off impractical in most scenarios but if, if you want to look cool and fancy you, you can do that but you can also practice that zoning with stage walls so you can put a stage wall like this again we're combining our movement and aim it's micro adjustments and tracking so what i'm doing is i'm slowly moving my mouse more and more to the left and I'm peeking slightly wider, but notice how the tip of my peak with my crosshair is always at the edge of the wall, okay? So I'm peeking just barely enough for them to see me and I'm able to get accurate shots off. You wanna be constantly moving left and right and making sure you're, you're able to get these bullets accurate. You can also do this if you want more practice. Just come behind this pole and work on like slight micro adjustments as you are peaking. And this is going to also help you with your movement and consistency of your dead zone. Let's talk about components of movement. There are a lot of different types of peaks in this game, a lot of different types of jumps. And if we combine good aim and movement, that's when you start to 
really win a lot of your gunfights. So these are the different types of peaks. There's a standard peak, uh, there's a crouch peak. These are all really easy to do. Jiggle peaks, shoulder peaks, jump peaks, wide peaks. I'm just gonna go down this list, all these jumps too, and I'm just gonna show you guys how to do it. Right after you make one footstep is when your maximum speed in this game. So a standard peak is just gonna be just like a normal peak. It's involving two, two little steps. Now, crouch peaks. This is where you literally crouch as you're peeking, okay? So this is really helpful, especially in close range fights. Let's say like there's an opponent right around the corner and he knows you, you're there too. So you can pre-fire these shots, but you can also crouch and throw off the crosser placement. Uh, jiggle peaks. This is where you just peek and unpeek really quickly, okay? Behind a piece of cover. Oh, also quick um, tip with jiggle peeking. You want to be jiggle peeking a lot of common angles, especially if you're a defender, because in this game, there's peeker's advantage. Peeker's advantage refers to the advantage that peekers get when they're actually peeking an opponent because due to server latency and whatnot, like the person that's peeking around the corner will see the guy that's holding the angle first, okay? Just on their computer screen. But also the person that is holding the angle has to react to whenever the person's gonna peek, okay? So that's why peekers do get a slight advantage. And so to combat that, if I'm a defender and I'm playing a really common angle like this, I will, I, I never want to just stand still because you're just going to get clapped, honestly. Like, especially in higher rank, like I am never standing still. I'm always jiggling. I'm always moving so that I don't just get pre-fired or at least pre-aimed because the higher ranks you go, they're going to be able to pre-aim the angle perfectly and shoot you as soon as they see you on the screen. So by jiggling the angle, you're still getting info of whether or not the person's there or whether or not they cross, but you are at a much less likely to die. If I'm holding an angle from an off angle though, you don't need to be jiggling it because like they don't expect you to be there. Shoulder peaks, this is where you get really close to the wall and you don't peek out all the way. So a jiggle peek involves you to be able to see the opponent with your crosser. But a shoulder peek, you can have your knife out, you can have your gun out, but this is where you don't expose your whole body to the enemy. You're just allowing your shoulder of your character model to peek out. And this is really helpful if you're trying to like bait out a shot. Like there are scenarios where ideally you want to be further away from the angle to take the gunfight because of angle advantage. So right now, because of the camera model, like I can't see the opponent, but the opponent will be able to see my shoulder peeking out right now. Uh, but the further away we are, we're going to be able to see each other at the same time. So ideally when you're peeking around a corner, you don't want to be the one that's close to the wall, but the shoulder peek lets you take advantage of this and it forces, let's say like you shoulder peek around this angle. So I'm the opponent and you're standing here, you're shoulder peeking me, your shoulder is going to pop out. So he might expect you to do like a standard peek. So he's holding a couple crosshair widths away from the angle, but he sees you shoulder peek. So he might like adjust his crosshair right here to the edge where you're shoulder peeking. And so what you can do is you bait out a shot or a few shots and then use peak wide. So that's a wide peak into killing the guy. So there are benefits to this because first you're throwing off his cross replacement. You're also increasing his weapons precision because after the first shot, that's when the bar starts to go up, right? Especially if they start trying to spray at you. And so they got to wait for their bullets to reset the recoil. And third, you get info about where the guy's shooting you from. So you can bait out a few shots and then peak wide. So that's a wide peak, okay? A jump peak is you can do it two different ways. You can do it without moving your uh, mouse right now. Okay. This is where I'm just getting info really quickly. Sometimes like you don't need to necessarily even be looking at what's in front of you. All you have to do is like look at the mini map. So you can like jiggle peek too, and you can look at the mini map as well to see if opponents are there. Okay. Jump picks are great. If you're trying to bait out op shots, you can also jump peek by like strafing midair uh, by turning your mouse. Okay. Silent step peak. So this is where you peak right before you're about to make noise, make that footstep. So you're still almost at full speed, but you're peaking around angles without making a footstep instead of just shift walking and peaking. You're going to lose all peakers advantage if you peak an angle shift walking. And this is a, a tip too, if you're fighting against oppers. Okay. So let's say like there was an opera here and like I flashed him out and he falls back here. Okay. There's a really good chance or there is a chance that the guy is going to want to do this on you. You know, he's going to he's going to want to do this to slow peak. And so if you're waiting for the repeak from an op, like just hold hold tight. So this is just crouch jump. You jump and then hold crouch at the end to 
get on top of higher boxes that you normally can't without cross jumping. So right here, I'm going to cross jump and let go at the end and I'll be able to make the jump there. Yeah, so this should be able to help you get on top of different boxes, screens, let's say on icebox, things like that, a lot easier. And you can also silent jump uh, up the stairs. So the best way to do this is you get slight forward momentum. You know how there's a silent step peak? And so right before I'm going to get the most amount of momentum without making a footstep. And the moment I jump, I'm going to press shift and then I'm going to be holding shift or my walkie as I'm jumping up. So like that. So this is how you get the most amount of momentum. This is really useful if you're trying to go up ramps really quickly to uh, any type of like heaven spot. So on Haven, a heaven ascent, the silent jump peak. So this is where you can combine the silent jump uh, with a jump peak. You can silent jump by holding crouch, jumping, and then letting go of crouch at the end. And so you can combine this with like, like many air strafes. And so, yeah, this will require you to use like your mouse a little bit more because you don't have as much momentum. So I, I know like that looks kind of silly, but I've seen pros do it in pro, pro matches. Yeah. So you can do this around any angle if you want to. And then there's the silent rope drop. What you want to do is with these ropes, you can drop silently and also do it really quickly by getting close. And as you're falling, because you need to hold W to actually like fall, but you tap the backspace key to cancel your forward momentum. So your character literally goes straight down along this rope. So that way you're able to latch onto the rope at the very bottom and not make any sound. Okay. So just hold shift key. So you can practice that as well in game. Oh, oh wait, actually I can show you guys this too. So this is air strafing. There's two ways of inputs for movement in this game. It's either our WASD keys or we can go straight. And then if I press D, I go diagonal, diagonal. But I can also turn my mouse and change my direction. And so air strafing allows you to combine both to have significant changes in your character's direction. So right there, I use both my D key and I move my crosshair to the right to allow my character to jump around this corner. Okay. And then bunny hopping. So there are two different variations of bunny hopping. Bunny hopping is using air strafes in between and timing our jumps as soon as we land and just moving around the map like this. A lot of times it doesn't have that many practical uses, but it is useful if you want to just quickly get away from an angle, but you can actually bunny hop without holding our W key because we're using four momentum. It's much easier, honestly, guys, like you can just bunny hop holding W, but if you didn't know, you can just use our full momentum initially and then use our only our A and D keys to still move forward. Okay. Yeah. Especially for neon mains out there, I'll just show you a cool trick. You can B hop and also in between like change directions by using the adjacent keys to B hop. So if I want to do a complete like 180. What I can do is, did you notice how I started using W and then D and then I turned my direction this way and started holding S and then A to go the other direction. So I literally just went in a full circle. Yeah, and you can also backslide with Neon if, uh, if you time it right. Yeah. So now let, let's actually go over angle clearing crosshair placement. So let's say I want to clear this whole area of the map. Peeling the angle refers to just going around the corner like this little by little. So notice how like my crosshair is tracing the edge of the, the angle okay, that I'm peeking around. So it's just little by little. Okay. You can do little by little, which I don't recommend, honestly, because whoever's holding you can kind of insta react and shoot you. I don't recommend also shift walking and doing this. A lot of low ELA players do this. This is how also you get just one tap straight up, but you can like peel the angle like this. If you're just trying to get to an area really fast. Okay. Like this is just peeling the angle. Like you're just tracking around the edges and just seeing if someone's there and you can stop and shoot if you do see someone. This is like maximum speed, but it's the riskiest type of way to clear angles. So slicing the angle or slicing the pie. This is where you divvy up each corner, each angle one by one by one. So you're able to isolate each gunfight. And the way you do it is by pre-aiming. So if this is the angle that I want to peek, I'm going to pre-aim and then move to the right. I'm going to pre-aim, move to the right, 
move to the right, pre aim, move to the right, move to the right. And I'm only exposing myself just enough to clear each angle at a time. Okay, so this is slicing the pie. And this is where the silent step comes in. This is like one of the safer ways to peek. But again, like after you've peeked, you're committing to the fight if the guy's there. The safest way, but it takes the longest to clear, is jiggle peeking in between. And this is where if you know how to dead zone, it becomes really useful. Because as you're clearing and jiggling, if you see a guy, you can just shoot accurately. So I'm going wider and wider each time and just peeking and clearing the angle. So lastly, let's talk about angle isolation and just putting everything together for the fourth and final drill. So let's put this together by going over how I would clear a beamate. There's this concept called a T roll. This is again to get the maximum speed. If there's a guy standing here and I'm right here, if the guy just runs straight forward at me, he's not going to be moving at all left and right on my screen. And it's just going to be a really easy target to shoot. But if the guy runs to the left or the right, completely perpendicular from my crosshair placement and my positioning, they're going to have the maximum speed. If they go diagonally, they're still going to be fast on my screen, but not as fast. It's just distance traveled over time on the X axis. If someone runs straight at me, it's the equivalent of just them coming straight at me. So they're not going to be moving at all on my screen. Same distance with my arrow like this. Okay, now on my screen, we've actually moved this much. But if we move the same distance, same length of the arrow, take it to the x-axis, in the same amount of time, I move this much. You're moving that extra distance. So ideally, if you're going to peek an angle, you want to peek perpendicularly of the positioning of your enemies. But to do that, you don't want to worry about these walls hitting you. So if this is the line of sight that they're holding, then I want to be perpendicular to it. So I'm going to be pre-aiming like this and boom, I'm ready. Okay, so max speed, I'm getting the kill. And if the guy is holding me, that guy's dead because I can just pre-fire him too with a jiggle. And so he could be standing here. He could also be standing here, right? And so I'm going to pre-aim a little bit and then peek out a little wider. And each time I'm pre-aiming a little bit more to the right each time. And I'm just ready to shoot whenever I see a guy. And notice how I wrapped around this way. Because if a guy is sitting inside this corner, he's closer to this wall than I will be to him. So his shoulder is going to peek out first. So I'm going to be able to kill him right there. And again, like I don't want to peek out like this and have my shoulders exposed to market. So after I've cleared that, I'm going to scoop back, peek logs. This is a weird off angle. Market, okay. People can be on stairs. CT, the other corner of CT. Sometimes jets can be posted up there. Stairs, switch. So you guys get the point, right? Like I'm fanning and I'm slicing each pie and incorporating jiggle peaks into them, which is the safest way to do it if it's dry. But if my teammates are like dumping open blind, like I have my flash out too, I'm just running in, man, okay? Don't worry about that. But right now, this is if we're just straight up dry clearing without any utility. What's next? What I'm going to do, I don't want to go here and expose myself a little bit to logs and also to lane. Okay. Like right now, my shoulder is definitely exposed. So again, I'm going to back up a little bit and using this line as a point of reference, because that is this ledge right here. So I can trace the head height right here. Pre-aim. Boom. Head height. Okay. So I jiggle that and then I can... Jiggle all these other angles in lane. Going here. And again, I have to be careful about these angles too. Mark it as well. And now this deep CT angle too. Because sometimes people play this as an off angle. Like the walkout. Okay. Or like this. So I'm just aware of these possibilities. And here, like this is where I can clear logs too. Because again, the guy sitting here won't be able to see me walking out of lane. So I'll be able to see him. Kill him. And then I can clear the rest of bow house. Or switch, sorry. Back sight. Backside, default box. Again, there's more angles back here. And again, angle advantage. If I'm at the edge of this lane, then the guy sitting dragon cannot see me. So I kill him. I clear with the drop. Maybe I'll throw a blind. If I don't have a blind, then I can drop. Again, back away from the angle. Slice the pie. Slice the pie. Yeah, and that is how I would clear all of B-Site. Slicing the pie is really useful if you don't know where enemies are. They could be holding any type of angle, even an off angle. You're just ready to shoot them, okay? Like your crosshair is ready. Weapon juggling is 
pretty useful to know if let's say like my teammate was dumb and decided to dry peak mid and they die to a sheriff or something okay i don't want people to take this gun so what i can do is i can throw my gun away okay and then i can juggle it to safety so that opponents can't grab it all i'm doing is just pressing g or whatever drop button you have switching back to my primary dropping switching dropping switching okay so you can do this for all your guns so going over gunfights at different ranges, short range, pre-fire angles. Let's say like I'm right around this corner. I'm pre-firing. You can also like pre-fire through the wall if you're close to it. Because the camera, I, I can't see the guy, but he might be able to see my shoulder. So I can wall bang through. Close range fight. Medium range, 80 strafe. Bursting two, three bullets. And then long range, what you can do is do a short peak combined into a wide peak. So the reason why this works is because people are holding like this, okay, for a long range fight. If you do a short peak into a wide peak, it's going to throw off their cross replacement a lot because normally they're going to hold like this for a standard peak. But if you do a short peak, they're going to have to readjust. And then if you follow it up with the wider peak, they're going to have to readjust again. This is just like an advanced technique that helps me win a lot of long range fights. A lot of pros use this too. Yeah, generally always aim between strafes. It's not the end of the world if you miss your first bullet. That's the whole point of being able to strafe in between. But you don't want to just spread like this and be a sitting duck. Okay, so targeted improvement with aim trainers is good for quick warm ups and also aim training post play session. Our drills spray control, flake micro adjustment drill, dead zone is one, one through four, five, you can do level four, ascent, B site, angle clearing. Deathmatch, I highly recommend Deathmatch over Team Deathmatch to be honest because it's really great for learning the maps and the cross replacement, learning callouts too. So if you're not good at calming, again, like that's also another skill that can be on the ladder. Maybe you might be really good with your mechanics, game sense, but your comps suck. If you want to learn callouts and you want to get used to using callouts during your games, what I like to do during Deathmatch is like I'm running around oh, and, I, and I see an opponent, okay? So I'll, let's say it's Sage. Okay, Sage Cat, you know? Like as you're playing, you can make these callouts too and get used to it. Team Deathmatch, great for being intentional about gunfights in different ranges because I think you tend to get a little more gunfights with uh, team deathmatch and also learning gun hygiene because it levels up the guns that you play with right but you can still work on your gun hygiene just even in traditional deathmatch but it's a little bit harder to do so because everyone else is using like rifles majority of people are using rifles in the lobby but in team deathmatch everyone has to use the pistols or smgs stuff like that so and then water views this tip is really 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 helpful this is actually something i used and i highly recommend you guys to do go back to the last three like 30 60 seconds of you dying so you can slow down the clip and see what went wrong in the gunfight or what went wrong in the round exactly that is actually a really really useful tool uh, for target improvement because now you, you start going back to your own deaths you can see which part of your mechanics you can really focus working on and then lastly to wrap up this whole lesson let's go over pro player aim styles asuna probably has like the flickiest aim he's on the higher sensitivity spectrum in this next clip notice how he flicks micro just every single time even though he has really high sensitivity and this was spray transfer here he got this kill okay right after he killed tens he knows that this third kill right here his bullets are gonna fly up here unless he waits for the bullet to reset so he actually aims right to his body and headshot and notice how like He's aiming for the body there after a few multi-kills because of the recoil and also because he's close range there. Okay. Micro adjustment, micro adjustment after a flick. So that's that's Asuna right there. Let's look at Alexander though. He's like the complete opposite. But he's strafing in between. And notice how he only shoots when the crosser's on. That's it. That was a micro flick, micro flick, jiggling. Because... Notice how he's jiggling that angle too, because he they know where he is now. He killed three of his teammates, so Rain is pre-aiming him. He's just jiggling, waiting for the guy to peek him, and so now the guy can't even hit a single bullet on him. Strafe, strafe, strafe. That was a flick. Micro adjustment, micro adjustment. Stage is hiding from the flash. Isolated. Boom gets a kill. He sees his, he sees his third guy, so he doesn't want to peek left and be overexposed to both uh this guy right here and the stage that's close notice how you he's peeling the angle here but as soon as someone does 
peek around the corner. He microflicks and makes sure he stops before he shoots. Okay, micro adjustment and again tracking. So he's tracing, tracing, tracing the angle, tracing, tracing. Sees a guy and kills him. It's a demon one. He's using the mound to isolate all these fights. This one's crazy. But it's actually not too hard to track jets if you get used to the the dash updraft um, range. Micro adjustment. Look, he's he's already pre-aiming for the next fight. Pre-aim gets this kill. He he knows there's a second guy that's waiting to trade him. He doesn't expect the second guy to be this close. So then again, like he flicks. Okay, and then again, look back to pre-aiming further angles. Okay, but he sees another guy. Flick gets a kill. See, so he's always pre-aiming, pre-aiming, pre-aiming. Easy. All right. So I'd say Demon One is kind of in the middle ground, but closer to low sense. Let's just watch ends last, and then call it a night. Again, like just notice how he's taking these fights. I'm going to slow it down for you guys. Flick. Shoot. Pre-aim. Flick. Micro just shoot. And then playing an off angle. So the Sova's already aiming like towards default and all that. Doesn't expect him to be out in the open. He's further away from the angle that enemies are peeking from. So he can afford to hold a really wide position. Especially if he knows that they're going to be uh, just running through. And then again, notice how he gets these two kills. So he repositions himself because the other people that are worried about this jet, they're going to be looking at screens and they're not going to be expecting him to be holding even wider. Or they can, they should be, but they're not. He's playing an off angle, which means he can still keep holding wider. Ah, right. okay, that is just illegal. What? <laughs> Micro adjustments, flick, flick. I hope all these examples demonstrated everything being put together. I mean, these are like just highlight clips, but yeah, <laughs> I hope my examples, these examples, everything that we covered today will help you guys with your mechanics. And again, don't forget about a lot of things I said about just the right mindset to have as you're going through this program. Thank you guys for staying in here in the first place. Thank you guys so much for everything.